True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. It's been nearly 40 years since young wife and mother Lynette Dawson disappeared from her New South Wales home. Lynette's last known conversation was with her mother. On the morning of January 8, 1982, her mother called to plan an outing to a local beach. Lynette agreed, but she was nowhere to be found when her mother arrived. Over the years, as Lynette remained missing, suspicions landed on her husband, Chris Dawson. His behavior leading up to and following his wife's disappearance was really improper and offensive. Lynette was not reported missing for six weeks, and she was quickly replaced by his teenage lover. Still, the investigation did not lead to any arrests. Finally, the case was reopened in 2015. Investigators gathered evidence for a case against Lynette's husband, and a true crime podcast, Teacher's Pet, put together the case with witness interviews and some well-supported theories. Join us at the quiet end today for a lovely drink. This is a cold case surrounded by years of deception and speculation that may finally be approaching a conclusion. What have we got for a beer today, Dick? So I've gotten some letters from Australian people kind of chastising me for choosing beers that aren't really that great from Australia. I'm speaking of Foster's in particular. (laughs) So I looked for some better beers, and I ended up picking Hop Hog from Feral Brewing Company in Baskerville, Australia. Now, this beer is really well-regarded, and at some point, maybe now even, has been the number one beer in Australia. So I, I hope you Aussies like this one better. Hop Hog is an American IPA. Looks like an IPA. It's got a hazy copper color, a nice white head, a little bit of lacing, nice aroma, citrus, pine, and caramel. Even more impressive was the taste. Got some orange, some melon, berry, a little pine, and a nice caramel background. This is a lighter-bodied IPA. On the sweet side, quite nice. Well, I really can't wait to try this one. I know you had to go through a lot to get this beer. It's not like they sell it at the corner store, right? That's right. But you did manage to get some, and I can't wait to try it. We managed to get a couple. All right. Well, let's open it up and take it down to the quiet end of the bar. Okay. All right. Follow me, Dick. Here we are. It's a little quiet at the quiet end. You know why? It's quieter than it usually is. The last few days have been pretty quiet. Yeah, and the bartender told me it's because of the coronavirus scare. People are really afraid. I mean, look there. There's even Purell on the bar. That never happens. That's all over the place. Yeah. And poor old Corona beer. (laughs) I'm not sure how you can come to the conclusion that Corona beer causes the coronavirus. Yeah, I don't know. Do you think people really think that, or is it just a superstitious thing, like, oh, that sounds like the disease, so I'm turned off? I don't know. Maybe. It's really weird. There's plenty of reasons not to drink Corona anyway, (laughs) Um, but contracting coronavirus infection is not one of them. No. It's a pretty popular beer before this happened. Oh, it is, and it's still pretty popular. I mean, nothing's going to happen to it. I mean, I always enjoy a Corona with a taco. Or a burrito. Yeah, that's what they invented Corona for. Yeah. So it's a shame, but I'm sure they'll be fine. They're part of a big company, aren't they? They are. They'll recover. So what's your take on this virus as a doctor? Are you thinking people are overreacting or you really need to be careful? What would you advise just, you know, for the hell of it? I think there's a bit maybe of overreaction but not bad. I think it's correct to be concerned about it. It does have a higher mortality rate than flu, so it's not totally benign. Okay. And they go through this all the time, but the best thing to do is wash your hands, right? Wash hands and keep your hands, your paws away from your face. Exactly. 
And that's always a good thing anyway. Yeah. That I mean, you should be practicing. That's, that's not anything particular to the coronavirus. It's just common sense. Right. Well, I mean, it is a scary thing, so I understand. But the corona beer thing is too much. And also the masks. That A mask is good for a medical practitioner or a sick person. But it really doesn't generally help you to be wearing a mask. No. In fact, the virus is a small enough virus that it can get through the mask. Right. Anyway, so it's you're not serving any purpose by wearing a mask. No, so keep clean and keep yourself healthy, too. Eat right, exercise. That gets your body strong. Yeah, and stay away from sick people. Yep, okay. And if you're sick, don't go to work. I know that's easier said than done, but really, if you can, avoid going out to work if or we, sending your kids to school. If you can. I mean, that's a huge issue. Yeah, and then we could get into political things, but we won't do that. Not me. No. Okay. Well, let's start on this story of Lynette, because this has been a big story with that Teacher's Pet podcast I listened to last year. Fascinating story. So it was really interesting to research this. So I can't wait to talk about it. Yeah, there's there's been a lot of stuff recently. I yeah. Mean, I didn't know how long ago this actually was. It's almost 40 years ago that she disappeared. I know. Can you believe it? I mean, that's it's incredible. It is. And it's taken them basically all this time to get to a point where they might actually charge someone. Right. I know. So, yeah, let's talk about it. Let's go. Good, interesting case. So we'll start where we usually start, at the beginning. Lynette Joy Sims was born in New South Wales, Australia in 1948. She had two brothers, Greg and Phil, and a sister named Pat. The Sims children grew up in a modest, middle-class home in a suburb of Sydney. They lived near the ocean, and they were all excellent swimmers. Now Lynn, with her sun-bleached hair and bronze skin, was the athletic one. And Pat, her sister, would remember Lynn as the brightest of all the children. They were closest sisters, Pat and Lynn were, and they shared a bedroom as little kids. Yes, yeah, so this childhood just kind of seems ideal, right? Living near the beach, running and swimming and playing. It sounds like a really great childhood. It does, and there's nothing that says it was anything other than a great childhood. Right. Well, even her romance with Chris started off really nice. Yeah, kind of a fairy tale romance, right? Kind of. I mean, these were good-looking people. Yeah, and she met Chris Dawson when she was 16 years old, and this was at a high school dance. Lynn was taken with Chris right away, and her mother really liked Chris. Good-looking guy, charming, didn't smoke, didn't drink. She believed her daughter had really found a fine young man. So they dated for several years, five years. And then in 1970, they got married at a church in Sydney. Right, so that's kind of her happily ever after. But Lynn tried to get pregnant for about six years and finally had surgery to help her conceive. She and Chris had actually filed to adopt a child before she finally learned that she was pregnant with her first daughter, Chanel. Soon afterward, they had a second daughter who they named Sharon. So Lynn was a very happy and attentive mom. Everybody said that she was thrilled with her daughters. In the 1970s, Chris Dawson and his twin brother Paul were well known around the northern beaches. So these were identical twins and they did just about everything together. Really a lot. Both played for the Newtown Jets in a rugby league and later they both played in rugby union. These were very good-looking young men, and they even did some modeling. They did a poster or a magazine insert for Levi's together, for one thing. Well, every, every picture I've seen of these two, they, yeah, good-looking boys. They sure were. They were extremely close, as I said. In fact, they ended up buying homes near each other, and they both worked as school gym teachers after their rugby careers were winding down. Lynn was a nurse, and she worked at a child care center. She was also a super devoted mom. Family and friends saw Lynn as a very doting mother who adored her daughters, and she really didn't miss a chance to talk about them and kind of brag about them to anyone who would listen. I mean, these were cute little girls, of course, from these gorgeous parents. But, you know, we don't want to focus too much on looks here because everybody has troubles in life, and being good-looking isn't going to make everything perfect. That's true. No. So the Dawson brothers had such a close relationship, it actually went beyond the normal closeness of siblings or twins. 
They were best friends. They were confidants. They followed nearly identical paths in life. When they were little kids, they created their own secret language for communicating with each other. They actually ended up needing speech therapy to undo the language patterns that they had established. Now that fact I find fascinating. Have you ever encountered that well, with it's, twins? It's fairly common. In really? Twin or multiple births that they typically are delayed with expressive language. And it's because they, not that they actually make up a secret language, but they don't necessarily speak in normal English or normal language. Wow. But I think this was even exceptional because it lasted till they were like five years old. Yeah, well, it can last even longer than that. But, really? But yeah, it's not unusual for multiple births to need speech therapy. Okay. Well, as kids, they also insisted on playing on the same sports teams and did that in adulthood too, actually. And they went to teacher's college together before becoming phys ed teachers. And these guys even drove the same model of car. So it was kind of weird. Yeah, I, you're getting into that realm. Yeah, we're entering the weirdness. Yes. <laughs> so in 1975, Chris and Paul were featured in an ABC program called Checkerboard. And this was a documentary about the closeness of twins. Lynn and Paul's wife, Marilyn, were interviewed. And both of the women just really appeared to adore their husbands. And they described the brothers' closeness as something that was just part of their lives and they supported it. In this video, Lynn is just very pretty and sweet and very well-spoken. But she definitely looks and sounds like she is in love with Chris. And then they had a professor on this program who was talking about the closeness of twins. And he talked about how, in some cases, twins are unhealthily codependent. Now, in this relationship, Paul appeared to be the leader, who appeared to be the dominant one. In the checkerboard show, Chris is shown training a group of boys in a gym class. He's shown telling them, these boys, that he will get them so fit, they're going to be irresistible to girls. Which I think would be fine, except when you learn more about Chris Dawson, it's a little creepy, just in the context yeah. of what he was doing. I mean, if you just look at it as, okay, he's got these kids in his gym class and he's going to make men out of them. Right, he's motivating them by yeah. saying you'll get girlfriends. Yeah, you do what I tell you, you'll get laid a lot or something, I don't know. Yeah, but I mean, it kind of gives you a look inside his mind. He was really full of himself. He just thought he was God's gift oh, to women, well, him and his brother. Yeah. To the extreme, right? Beyond just being confident. Oh, absolutely. But, you know, nobody's done anything to the contrary. <laughs> no. You know, they grew up. They're good-looking guys. They're intelligent guys. They have their choice of women to date. They uh, excel at sports. Hey, holy cow. How can you beat that? Right. So they were described by neighbors and friends of Lynn and Marilyn, though, their wives, as secretive men who really didn't engage in much of the conversations when they were in groups. And their wives, Marilyn and Lynn, seemed to be submissive women and very soft-spoken women. Now, I don't think that Lynn felt she was quite as attractive as her husband, Chris. And there was kind of a non-evenness in the relationship where he had the control. I mean, I think that's definite. Plus, you know, Lynn had been raised to be submissive to her husband. Her mom was very old-fashioned. Yeah, so I guess the marriage wasn't that great or had some cracks in it. Sure, and I think Lynn just wanted to do everything she could to make it look good and to make it better than it was. Sure. So one, of, one friend of Lynn's would remember how Lynn tried to please Chris and save her marriage when things were getting rocky. Lynn went out and bought some sexy lingerie and said that she was going to put it on and dance for Chris to try and bring the romance back into the marriage. You know, which is fine if that's what you want to do. But Lynn seemed uncomfortable and kind of desperate with this, so it was kind of sad. And then friends of Lynn noticed bruises and red marks on her arms, and this was in the months leading up to her disappearance. Unfortunately, no one spoke up and asked her about them, really. Now, she didn't appear to be afraid of Chris, but she did act differently around him, kind of more cautious and a bit on edge, trying to please him. So he was definitely controlling her. Yeah, it just doesn't sound like things are going that well. No. So let's get into these brothers and their teaching careers and what was going on there. 
Well, as teachers, Paul and Chris were part of a group, or a small group of teachers, who viewed having sex with high school girls to be a perk of the job. Now, okay, this is 1980 or so, right? Right. But even even then, that wasn't a perk of the job. Well, of course not, no. But 16 was the age of consent, so it wasn't necessarily illegal. But it certainly wasn't ethically okay. No. No. And, and I'm, I'm just amazed that the school tolerated it. I mean, it wasn't just the two of them. There was several other teachers who were sexually active with students. And yeah, this is a big problem. This is just something that I can't quite grasp. No. Well, you shouldn't because it was really wrong and kind of shocking how it went on. Yeah. I mean, the, the impression I got was, uh, oh, yeah, so what? Yeah. I don't know if it was that blasé, but nobody did anything. Yeah. Paul was the more dominant one, and Chris was always looking for his approval. And evidence would show that Chris had actually offered up some teen girl students to his brother for sex. Yuck. Like some kind of a sick gift to his brother. So now we're getting into the real yucky territory. Now, both of these brothers had teen lovers who they spent time with on school trips and even on the school grounds. Witnesses from back then in the late 70s and early 80s have said that there was a group of about eight male teachers in their 20s and 30s at the high school who frequently had sex with their girl students, their female students. I'm just amazed. Now, former students have said that the culture at the school was that there was this group of male teachers and they preyed on the young girls. And these were 15, 16, sometimes 17-year-old girls, but usually not seniors, usually the younger ones. So, of course, there were sporting trips and school trips where these men had sex with the girls, or the girls would go out to the teacher's car or even to their homes. Most of the teachers knew about this, a lot of the students, too, but nothing happened. The deputy headmaster would recall this time in the 70s and 80s, and he said he talked to Chris more than once about being alone in his classroom with students with the door closed. But he felt there was nothing else that could be done, is what he said, which I think is kind of a cop-out. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's, that's being charitable. So, I mean, to put it mildly, the school officials at Cromer High School, where they taught, let down the female students. No question. And these girls are traumatized through the rest of their lives because of this. Yeah, teachers at the school took advantage of the teens. Chris and Joanne's relationship in particular was common knowledge. Right. So Joanne was a student who caught Chris's attention, and she became the focus for him. She did. The Dawson twins both picked out girls they liked from their PE classes and invited these girls to their homes after school offering them money to work as babysitters for their children, but then, of course, having sex with them, too. But this one student, Joanne, was 16 years old when she became involved with Chris Dawson. Joanne came from a broken home where there was abuse going on, and Chris really exploited that, presenting himself to her as her savior, her lover, and her protector. But Chris became obsessed with Joanne, he watched her, and he left love notes in her school bag. So they began what would be described as a very intense sexual relationship, which the other students and teachers knew about, and even some of the parents knew all about Chris and Joanne and what was going on. They did, and even some of the parents knew about it. Right. It's really crazy. Joanne was in the 11th grade in 1980, and that's when Chris Dawson really pursued her at Cromer High School. That's where he was a gym teacher. And he had noticed her when she was in the 10th grade. He liked her then and actually moved her schedule so that she would be in his class the following year. So he really plotted this out. And the strategy Chris used when he preyed on Joanne was the same strategy he had learned from his brother Paul. And that's how they really took advantage of these girls. But both brothers would deny this, Paul and Chris. Neither one of them would own up to this. Well, of course. But according to witnesses, Chris invited Joanne to babysit his daughters, and from there she became his lover. Joanne had frequent sleepovers at the Dawson house. 
presumably as a babysitter. She swam nude with Chris in the pool, and he took her out in his car for hours. Supposedly, he was teaching her how to drive. Now, somehow, Chris hid all this from Lynette, although we're not sure. There's probably a certain amount of denial going on. Well, there had to be some denial, yes. But, I mean, to be fair, he was deceiving her. So you can't really blame her for believing her husband. Now, you have to remember, it seems like Lynn just adored her husband. She called him My Chris. And she told people, you know, I trust my Chris. He's a good man. So there's a lot to get through before she would have realized he wasn't all that he was cracked up to be. Okay. But she's there babysitting and eventually moved in to be the nanny or something. Yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah. Well, Chris was very infatuated with this 16-year-old girl, and Joanne fell in love with him. In October of 1981... Chris moved Joanne into the home, and yeah, supposedly as a live-in nanny for his two daughters. What a deal. And Chris actually told her to act like an innocent girl who was just there to babysit. But she would later say that he had sex with her whenever the opportunity was there. And sometimes that meant he created the opportunity. Well, sure. So there was a neighbor of Lynn's who heard Lynn crying during an argument with Chris on the day before Joanne moved into the Dawson home. The neighbor was concerned, so she walked down to the Dawson house, and outside of the house, she saw Lynn holding her younger daughter Sharon in her arms, as Chris towered over her yelling. Now remember, he was a big, imposing figure. This guy was lifting weights, playing football, and Lynn was actually very petite. So the neighbor saw Lynn run back toward her house, saying, what is daddy doing to us, to her toddler? And the neighbor, of course, thought this was really sad. And she cared about Lynn, so she actually invited Lynn for tea later that day, and she asked Lynn what was going on. And that's when Lynn told her that Joanne, the 16-year-old student, was moving into their home. But still, Lynn denied that Chris was having sex with the babysitter. The neighbor was certain that Chris was having an affair with this girl. And she was sure who (laughs) who wouldn't look at that as being suspicious that he's having an affair with her. And this is just Lynn is just putting up blinders. Yeah, I think that's probably fair. But the neighbor totally believed that Chris wanted to replace Lynn with Joanne because it had gotten to the point where he was like obsessed with this girl. But, you know, like you said, Lynn was in some denial and people did try and warn her but her answer was always that she trusted her husband. And Lynn told friends that Chris was just being a very nice person and he was looking after a troubled student. He also said final exams were coming up and he was planning to help Joanne, so he needed to spend time studying with her. Extra time. She needs my personal attention. That's right. So, you know, most people knew that Chris was having sex with Joanne, but he created a cover story that was going to make him out to be the good guy. So according to Chris, as long as Joanne was with him and his family, she was safe from her dysfunctional family. Maybe this is ironic, but Chris was actually able to use Joanne's unstable home life and her lack of self-esteem to lure her into a relationship with him. Sure. And that's true. I mean, he planned this and executed it very nicely. Yeah, I mean, he was just predatory and very demanding. And, of course, Joanne went along with whatever he wanted. She gave him sex and companionship whenever he wanted it. But, you know, Lynn was kind of coming into her own. She's an adult woman who would challenge him. And he didn't want that. He wanted her out of the way. He wanted the young girl. I mean, Lynn was very pretty, but I don't think he saw her as, you know, as good looking as he thought he was. He thought he deserved a young girl. So very creepy. (laughs) An understatement there, Jill. Sure. So, I mean, it's safe to say he wanted Lynn out of the way. I think it's safe to say that. Yes. But his behavior was brazen, and it showed very little respect for his wife or his children. Lynn's siblings knew that Lynn's marriage was in trouble, but Lynn's mom, Helena, thought that Chris could really do no wrong. 
She was old-fashioned and believed that the man was always right, and she admired Chris so much that it would be years before she would turn against him and realize who he really was. Yeah, now after Joanne moved in, tensions obviously escalated in the Dawson household. And this is where Helena began to see that Chris wasn't the perfect guy she had made him up to be. Yes. So she made some notes and kept them in notebooks. And when she died a few years later, she gave the books to Lynn's sister. And some of these were shared with the media. And, and these are just some notes written by Helena. Yeah, and they were just for herself. And she had asked Pat, Lynette's sister, not to share them. But as things went on, Pat said, you know, it's important that I share these, and I think my mom would understand. So some notes from Helena's visits to the house in Bayview were October 6th, 1981, Chris comforting Joanne on bed in study. October 7th, 1981, Joanne went to school with Chris. Joanne has problems, and she is Chris's shadow. Lynn is at home and very unhappy, almost in tears about Chris. And October 8th, I think it's an imposition and unfair on Chris and Lynn to be put in this situation. But Lynn seems to think it's okay. Well, she didn't really, but... Well, she wasn't willing to leave him, is the no, thing. No, that's, that's for sure. She had, I think, a two-year-old and a four-year-old. Yeah. So, I, and, you know, you can kind of understand. Well, and plus these were kids that they had tried for years and years to conceive and had all sorts of problems and finally had surgery that was able to get her pregnant. So she's got some investment here. Well, of course. I mean, what mother doesn't? And it's really hard to believe that she would have left those kids behind. That's right. a big thing. Yeah, well talk about that, right? Yeah. I mean, Lynn did eventually become overtly suspicious of her husband's relationship with Joanne. And in one incident, Lynn came home and found the teen swimming nude in the family pool. Now, she also found Joanne on the bed with her husband. And after one of these incidents, depends who you're talking to, whose version of the story. But we do know that Lynn confronted Joanne, saying, you've taken liberties with my husband and kicked her out of the house. So I don't like the feeling I get with that because it seems like she's blaming the girl. But I can see how that would be easier for her if she can just blame the girl and get rid of her. Maybe she can save her family. Maybe. But and the, the other thing was that she got her out of the house. That's important. That's important, sure. I just don't think if that happened in my house that I would be that forgiving. I think I would be done with that. Oh. You know, just to warn you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't teach, and I don't have any 16-year-old female students. Well, no, and you have ethics and morals, and you love me, so I'm not worried about it. Okay. You got that. Yep. So Joanne moved down the road for a short time. She stayed with Paul Dawson, his wife Marilyn, and their three kids. So to me, it seems like Marilyn had turned her back on her sister-in-law, right? That's oh, not cool. That's, that's a shitty thing to do. It's like a slap in the face, allowing Chris's lover to live with her. You know, and I'm not without empathy for Joanne. But still, I think Marilyn's role here was to support her sister-in-law, and she didn't. Right. Now, of course, you have to think that Marilyn was going through similar things with her husband, even though she would deny it. So she's got her own issues, too. Yeah, but still. <laughs> I mean, what Lynn had really hoped that sending Joanne away was going to give her a chance to repair her relationship with Chris. But Joanne really wasn't that far away. She wasn't. She's no. just down the road Yeah. with his brother and sister-in-law. It's almost as if she's still living with them. Almost. It's not great. Now, there would be accusations later by investigators that Marilyn used a credit card belonging to Lynn after Lynn disappeared, in order to make it look like Lynn was still alive. You know, and this was before cameras and stuff, so we wouldn't have proof of that. But also, Marilyn was once quoted as saying that she didn't think Lynn fought hard enough for her marriage. So that's a real shitball thing to say. Isn't it? Yeah, that's terrible. I mean, one thing I really cannot abide is women turning on each other like that. That's so shitty. I mean, uh, Marilyn should have understood. I'm not touching that one. 
Well, don't you think Marilyn <laughs> should have understood what Lynn was going through and should have, you know, bonded with her? But she didn't. Well, no, it's an easy thing to say is that what I would consider appropriate was that Marilyn says, I'm sorry, Joanne, you can't stay with us either. Sure. If you really want to help the girl, there are other ways. There certainly are. So just days before Christmas of 1982, Joanne had agreed to run off to Queensland with Chris. They were going to run away together. But she changed her mind just as she got south of the border and asked Chris to turn around and go back. So at this point, Joanne was expressing some uncertainty about their relationship. So you have to think that this may have been what really convinced Chris that he needed to get rid of Lynn. If Joanne wasn't going to put up with it anymore, I mean, we've heard husbands before that decide to get rid of their wife if their lover threatens to break up. Yeah, you're right. And most men would just get a divorce, but not Chris. Well, there's that subset of men that would look at that as saying, I I can't get a divorce. Well, and a lot of that is just selfishness, not wanting to leave the house and having to pay child support. Absolutely. Which is ridiculous. Well, when you consider the alternatives, right? (laughs) Sure. I mean, I just don't know what makes a person make that leap to killing someone. It's just a leap that my mind could never get to. No, that's a tough one. I mean, no matter... What you're looking at if, if you divorce and, and you're thinking, well, financially I'm taking a hit. I'm not going to see my kids as much. They're not going to like me maybe as much. There's all sorts of things. But it's still for me a huge stretch to figure, okay, then if I'm not going to do that, I might as well kill her. Well, there is such a just such a large aspect of feeling entitled here, right? Like he felt it was all about him. He's entitled to have the girl that he wants to have sex with. He's entitled to keep his children, to keep his house. It's all about him. It's just amazing to me that anyone could be that self-centered, not even considering that his daughters are never going to know their mother, which is heartbreaking. They were very young. They were. So after that, after she decided she wasn't going to run away with Chris, Joanne went on a holiday with some of her friends. And according to her, Chris insisted that she call him every day. He actually said that he would die if he didn't hear from her, and he told her that he had hives from missing her and being away from her. That's pretty romantic. I miss you so much. I've got hives and I'm scratching all the time. (laughs) But in early January of 1982, Lynn believed that whatever had been going on between Chris and Joanne was really cooling off, right? Because Joanne's not around. And she still wants to save her marriage. And she'd been asking Chris to go to counseling. So in early January, he finally agreed to go to counseling with her. Yes, and and that was something that did not go really well. So on January 8th, Lynn and Chris had an appointment with a marriage counselor. And on the elevator up to the office of the counselor, Chris pushed Lynn up against the wall, held her there by the throat. And he said to her as he gripped her throat, I'm only doing this once. And if it doesn't work, I'm getting rid of you. So this is hearsay of what Lynn told her friend Annette. And this would be seen by many people as a death threat against Lynn. Uh, Well, I certainly would take it that way. And what's this, I'm only doing this once? When does counseling ever last once? (laughs) Counseling is an extended period of time. You're not going to accomplish much in one session. No, you're not going to accomplish anything. That's just ridiculous. Now, Lynn laughed all this off. She didn't believe Chris would ever kill her. So was it possible that after the counseling session, Lynn knew the marriage was over and she decided to leave her husband and her children in her home? Not likely, and certainly her friends didn't think so. Actually, after this first counseling session, Lynn told several women that she thought it was going to work out and her marriage was going to be saved. Right, so after this session... Lynette was optimistic about her marriage, and to some she seemed convinced that the marriage was going to be back on track. Lynn told her friends that the appointment with the therapist went really well. Chris told police later that it went well. But maybe Chris needed Lynn to be calm and cooperative. Maybe he was planning something. And if that were true, he wouldn't want her to get angry and go to her mother's or move out with the kids. So it was just later on January 8, 1982, when Lynn disappeared. 
So this is the day they had their first counseling session. Right. We can read a bunch of things into that. Well, yeah, and another shocking thing, within two days, Chris had moved Joanne back into the family home. It's just crazy. Joanne slept in Chris's bed with him, and she began wearing Lynn's clothing and even her wedding rings. Chris told his daughters that Lynn had just been a pretend mom and that Joanne was now their new mother. So I think all of this after with the disappearance is even worse than what happened beforehand as far as making him look guilty. Well, absolutely. And why didn't anything come out of this? Well, that's the shocking thing, is nothing really did. Not for many, many years. No, that's the amazing thing. It is. It's upsetting. So Lynn's mother is thought to be the last person who spoke to Lynn. She talked to her on the phone January 8th, the day she disappeared. So Chris had answered the phone when Helena called, and he seemed reluctant to put Lynn on the phone. But Helena insisted that she wanted to talk to Lynn. Now, Helena told Lynn that she sounded sozzled. Uh, I think by that she meant that Lynn sounded like she was drunk. Yeah, that's one of those cute Aussie terms, sozzled. Yeah. So this was unusual because Lynn wasn't a drinker. No, and she sounded really inebriated, according to her mom. Well, she just had this fantastic therapy session. Right, and she she was feeling good. Allegedly, I mean... This is where he was going to strangle her or something? He had his hand on her throat on the way up to the meeting? Yeah, this is later that evening after that happened. Yeah. So even as she was telling friends, I'm thinking things are going to go well. Maybe she was drinking because things actually went poorly. Well, actually, you know, Chris made her this drink. And there's a lot of suspicion that it was drugged. Because allegedly there had been times when Chris wanted to have sex with Joanne when he would fix Lynn a drink so she would fall asleep. Well, that's classy. So he'll he'll drug her with a drink, she'll fall asleep, and he'll screw Joanne. Right, exactly. But, you know, this time Joanne's not there, so that's not his motivation. So he had a different motivation for wanting her to be suzzled, as they say. Obviously. So on the phone, Lynn told her mom that the counseling had worked and that she and Chris were repairing their marriage and that he had made her a lovely drink, which she was enjoying. So Joanne and Helena made plans to meet with other family members at the Northbridge Baths the next day. And they were planning a picnic there with the children and with Chris. Yeah, Chris had asked a close friend of his named Phil Day to come to Northbridge Baths also. Phil had been a groomsman at the wedding of Chris and Lynn. And Chris told Phil he wanted to talk to him about his marriage problems. Now, Phil was a well-liked guy, and he was pretty much respected by the entire family. So he said, I'm happy uh, to meet with you. I'll be over at Northbridge, and I'll be there for you, Chris. Right. So when Helena arrived at the Northbridge Baths on Saturday, January 9th, her granddaughters were happy to see her and ran over and hugged her. But then Chris asked her, where's Lynn? So this surprised Helena, even made her feel very worried, because... Yeah, because she, of course, thought that Lynn was with Chris and the kids. Yes. But Chris explained to Lynn's mom that he had dropped off Lynn at a bus stop early that morning. Then, a short time later, Chris was called over to the kiosk where the public phones were to answer a phone call. And Chris was gone for about 10 minutes on the phone call. And when he came back, he said that the call had been from Lynn He said that Lynn told him she was needing some time away to think things over, and he told Helena and Phil Day that Lynn had said she was with friends, that she was on the Central Coast, and that they shouldn't worry because she would be in touch again. Chris then asked Phil to take Helena and the two girls home to Helena's house, and Phil agreed. Now, the girls were supposed to go back to their Bayview house with Chris as he was on Christmas break. But Chris had something else he wanted to do. He wanted to go and pick up Joanne. So it's very possible that that phone call was from Joanne, who had been instructed to call him every day, collect. And it wasn't from Lynn, because he's killed her. Well, that's what we think, sure. We don't have proof of that, but that's the allegation, yes. So Chris didn't tell Phil anything about Joanne. 
Chris had said to Phil that he wanted to talk about his marital, marital problems with Phil, but he never actually did. It was a couple years, actually, uh, until Phil found out about Joanne. And this was even though Joanne had been basically living with Chris that whole time. So when Chris did talk to Phil in the following weeks, he kept telling him that he missed Lynn and he couldn't wait for her to return. Well, sure, and Phil believed it, not knowing anything about this lover that he had brought into the home. Exactly. Now, like I said, Lynn's mom, Helena, had been very worried that Saturday. It made no sense to her for Lynn to go off without a plan to return, especially without her daughters. Plus, she wouldn't have put her mother through that long trip to the baths if she hadn't planned on being there. Helena didn't drive, and she had to take public transportation out there. It was quite a thing to do. And Lynn wasn't the type of person to leave for days and not let her mother or anyone else know about it. Just something she had never, never done. So, Joanne had called Chris from a public telephone on Saturday, we believe. And then on Sunday, January 10th, Chris met Joanne at the beach where she was on holiday with friends. He actually had driven through the night to pick Joanne up leaving his girls with Lynn's mom. Her holiday wasn't over, but Joanne was ready to leave. And I think Chris was really pushing for that. So when Chris showed up, Joanne's friends would remember him as acting strange and agitated, not his usual kind of charming self. And he drove Joanne back to his Bayview house and moved her right in. That was it. That was it. So Lynn's disappearance had to look very suspicious at the time. Oh, God. Yes. Right? Yeah. And nowadays, when a mother and wife disappear, as detectives are going to question the husband, the women's friends, the family, and investigate the state of the marriage. And if the husband is in a sexual relationship with a schoolgirl when the wife vanishes, and if that relationship is intensifying and the girl moves into the wife's bed, you would think the police would be very skeptical. But, you know, in this case, very little investigation was done. The Dawson's property in Bayview wasn't searched at that time. No one went knocking on doors or talked to neighbors. And Chris Dawson really showed no signs of looking for Lynn. Maybe a couple cursory things, but nothing significant. He didn't call her friends, and he didn't report her missing for six weeks. (laughs) There's a red flag, huh? I mean, you really couldn't get much more suspicious unless he was covered in blood. You couldn't. He did place an ad in a local paper asking Lynn to come home. But if she was alive and did return home, what's she going to find? She would have found Joanne in her bed, wearing her clothing, with her wedding rings on, her fingers. (laughs) Things just didn't add up here. Isn't that just craziness? It is. And I'm just thinking, how does he figure he's going to get away with this? But he did. He did. I mean, at least for many years. Annette Leary, a co-worker of Lynn's from the child care center was someone who Lynn had confided in a few times. And she, along with others who knew Lynn, never went to the police with their suspicions after Lynn disappeared, even though they did have suspicions that Chris might have done something to her. But they would live with regret and guilt for not having said something immediately. You know, they said things like, well, I thought the police would come to us. I thought the police were taking care of it. So I didn't go to anybody. But Annette had seen bruises on Lynn, and Lynn had actually admitted that Chris had gotten rough with her. I mean, like we know, Chris was this muscular, powerful guy who lifted weights and played sports. But Lynn would blame herself, and she would say that she had done something to make him angry, and that Chris really hadn't meant to hurt her. It's really sad. We've heard that story before. So sad. So Lorraine Watson owned a bridal salon back in 1980, and Lynn would go there to get a dress. Lynn Lynn went there to get a dress made for some occasion. Lorraine noticed finger marks on both of Lynn's arms, and she had bruises that looked like someone had grabbed her really hard. She also saw a huge bruise on Lynn's thigh, like she'd been kicked. So Lorraine obviously was kind of shocked by this bruising and asked Lynn what had happened. And at first Lynn said it was a long story, But after being in the store for a while and getting more comfortable, Lynn said that she was married to a very violent man. And Lorraine asked her, why don't you leave him? Lynn said she didn't know where she would go. She had two kids, 
fairly young in this lovely house. And yeah. she loved the bastard. You know, there's plenty of places to go. Yes, but I can also empathize with how she was feeling. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Now, remember, Lynette was very tired in the years before she disappeared. She had these two young kids, a job, and Chris was very demanding. He expected her to keep a pretty much perfect home. So her days as an athletic young girl were behind her. She really didn't have time to exercise and pay attention to her looks the way that Chris did. She came into work one day in 1981 and told Annette that she had found Chris in bed with Joanne. And until then, and until then, I guess she believed that Chris had been faithful to her. But this had kind of broken the barriers of denial that she'd put up. So Lynn did go see Joanne's mother. Her name was Margot to discuss her concerns that Chris and Joanne were in a romantic relationship. But Joanne's mother rejected Lynn's concerns. She told Lynn that Joanne would never do anything like that, and that she was sure that Joanne and Chris were just friends. So Margot's really full of it. Yeah. Yeah. But Joanne's father, John Curtis, contradicted this assertion. He said that Margot had told him that Joanne was sexually active with Chris. Now, it's interesting that Joanne's mother was married to an abusive man. So there's, there's some insight into how she's going to act. Sure. She felt like having Joanne out of her house and at the Dawson house had helped relieve some of the tension in her house. So in her mind, it was a good thing for Joanne to be with the Dawsons, or at least out of their house. Yeah, so she'd basically just thrown her daughter under the bus for her own convenience. Right. But, you know, when police spoke with Margot, she told them that she never suspected that Joanne was involved with Chris Dawson. So did she decide to just act dumb because of how it would look? I mean, of course, it would look bad if she knew her daughter was sleeping with a married teacher twice her age and Margot was just fine with it. She did admit to hearing rumors of an inappropriate relationship, but she never confronted Joanne, she said. And Margot said, well, you know... Even if it's true, there's really nothing I could have done about it. My daughter has her own mind. See how we've swung from, oh, this never happened to, well, if it did, so what? Well, yeah, and that's kind of a lot of the attitudes. Like, well, there's nothing I could have done about it. That seems to be what a lot of people said. Yeah, Chris was blaming Lynette. He said she might have left him to join a religious cult. See, we're going to start kind of demonizing the missing person. Sure. Now, and according to Chris, Lynette had a problem with money, and she spent well beyond their means. Their credit cards were often maxed out. His rugby career had brought in good money, and he lived in a really nice house in the popular district of Bayview. But according to Chris, they couldn't afford the kind of lifestyle that Lynn wanted. By 1980, he'd retired from playing rugby. He was only working at the school full-time. He had no other job. Yes. So almost six weeks after Lynn disappeared, on February 18th of 1982, Chris finally went to the police and reported her missing. And I guess they didn't ask too much about why he'd waited so long. But he stuck to his story about her leaving and said, you know, there's nothing to worry about, because according to Chris, Lynn had left to join a religious group, and this was after they had argued about her spending issues. Okay, but the idea that Lynette would abandon her two two girls was impossible for those who knew her to believe. I mean, she was a loving mom, and nothing in her life suggested that she would leave her kids. She'd said nothing about joining a cult to her mom or her sister or anyone else, and she was close with a lot of people. I mean, Lynn really wasn't even a religious person. She was a family person, very involved with her daughter's lives, and didn't even attend church. So it was very unlikely she would have done that. So either Chris really believed that Lynn was safe and well, or he was lying and he had killed her. Now, he always talked about her in the present tense, even telling some reporters and neighbors that he hoped she was living happily somewhere. He never publicly referred to her in the past tense. Yeah, but (laughs) just the fact that he moved this girl into his bed... And Lynn didn't take her clothes or her jewelry or anything and left her daughters? Yeah. It's just not believable at all. I mean, the more worrisome thing was how police seemed satisfied to just take his word for it. Lynette's family was interviewed only once and in a very superficial, cursory way. 
it seemed that they totally ignored the fact that Chris was living as a couple with a 16-year-old high school girl. And Lynn's friends would say they were not interviewed at all at the time. Yeah, but nothing happened. Yep, nothing happened. Today's show is sponsored by Audible. Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment. This includes podcasts, guided wellness programs, theatrical performances, comedy, and audiobooks. We've been Audible members for several years now, and I can't imagine living without it. Audible gives me the gift of found time because I can listen while driving, while exercising, while making dinner, even as I'm dozing off to sleep. Well, we really use it a lot when we go on car trips. That's the best time. Yes. I mean, it makes the time fly by. It does. Now, when you join Audible, you get one credit for any title and two credits for Audible Originals that come from a monthly selection. And what a lot of people don't know is that you can get access to daily news digests from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. With Audible, you can download titles so you can listen anytime, anywhere, even if you don't have Wi-Fi available. Even when you switch devices, Audible keeps your place. I love that. That's one of my favorite features. I'm listening to some books on Audible right now by John Sanford, who is a writer of thriller mystery stories. Uh, if anyone's ever read him, he writes about Lucas Davenport, who's a hotshot detective. And his other main character in another series of books is Virgil Flowers. Yes, Dick really loves his detective books. And I turned him on to Audible so he can also listen, which he loves. Right, yeah, Dick? well, in the, the Virgil Flowers one I'm listening to, this is the first book in the Virgil series. I just love the guy reading it. He just has this really great voice that makes the book even better than if I'm reading it myself. Well, sure. I mean, these are professional voice actors, I would say. And they really put a lot of personality into it. And yeah. it's just great. So the Audible app is free and it can be installed on all smartphones and devices. If you want to try Audible, just visit audible.com slash brewery or text brewery to 500-500. That's audible, A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot com slash brewery, B-R-E-W-E-R-Y. So the police chose to believe the sports star and showed no interest in searching for Lynette Dawson. In fact, it was in 1999, over 17 years after she went missing, that the case was finally given to an officer who believed her disappearance was suspicious and that it warranted more investigation. So what's the deal here? Is it just that the police were incompetent or were they influenced by... Chris, or what's going on? How did nothing get done? It seems to be many factors, almost like the perfect storm of incompetence or neglect in this case. It's really an amazing thing. Yeah, well, I'm thinking that the police are just layabouts. So kind of they... seems like it, but you know, I think really what they did is they took his word for it, which they never should have done, of course. Yeah, but that's still on them. Absolutely. They... Oh, yeah, it is. So actually, during this time, Chris had managed to get divorced from Lynn, and he did this in 1983 on the grounds that she had abandoned the family. So this is only like, what, a year, year and a half after she's gone? Right, and I thought usually he had to wait like six years, yeah. or maybe that's just to say someone's dead, and he wasn't saying she was dead. He's saying that she just went off and started a new life. And he's going to divorce her. Yes. Now, he actually knew someone, like a distant cousin or someone, where a woman had left her family and was alive. And maybe that's where he got the idea to say that. We mm -hmm. don't know. Yeah. But that's a super rare thing. Yeah. Now, soon after, he left Cromer High School, and he went to teach at Beacon Hill High School. Then in 1984, guess what? He married Joanne. And they got married in this little ceremony at the house, the Bayview House. Now, witnesses at the ceremony were his brother, Paul, and Paul's wife, Marilyn, and they had been the people that were previously living on the same street as Lynn and Chris with their three kids. Yeah, so they are going along with this too, and they had to know she didn't leave. 
They well, knew the situation better yeah. than most people. Yeah. And, you know, he's he's also having to change jobs. So I'm thinking he's still sleeping with other girls. He hasn't changed his ways just because he's changed his wife. Oh, so he he didn't confine his sexual activities to Lynn and Joanne? He had others too? Oh, sure. I mean, there were other girls before he focused on Joanne. And then I believe, and I have no proof, of course, but I believe after he'd been with Joanne a while, he started doing it again. It's in his character. Yes. So that same year they got married, Chris moved his children and Joanne to the Gold Coast to live in a new house near Dream World, again near Paul and Marilyn Dawson. And now these twin brothers were both teaching at a different high school. And that was... Kumbaba. That's how I'm pronouncing it. <laughs> okay, hopefully we're right. It's Kumbaba High School. So Paul and Marilyn's children attended the school, as did Chris's older girls, Chanel and Sharon. And then Joanne gave birth to a daughter, Kristen. So Cheryl and Sharon felt like Joanne showed an obvious preference for her own biological child. And Chris eventually became abusive and unbearably controlling with Joanne. Although the girls would always say he was a good dad to them. So Joanne began to believe that Chris had killed Lynn after he's starting to be abusive to her. And she, you know, remembered that he had told her from day one that Lynn would never be returning. Now, she would also say that before Lynn disappeared, she had witnessed Chris being verbally abusive to Lynn and making fun of her looks and calling her names. So it was definitely a toxic situation before Lynn disappeared. Oh, absolutely. So after some time goes by, Joanne's getting older and she's realizing what probably happened here. And she's becoming afraid, too, for her own life. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the way Chris was talking, you'd get the impression that he killed Lynn. And he could do that with her, too. So she left him in 1990. And after she left Chris, he began to see his soon third wife. Her name was Sue. And Chris and Sue lived apparently happy lives in Yapoon, near Rockhampton, on Queensland's Capricorn Coast. Now there, Sue taught science at St. Brendan's Catholic Boys' School. And Chris had become a teacher at St. Ursula's Girls' College is kind of scary. Yeah. Yeah. It's letting the fox loose in the hen house, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Now, Sue had twin children, Kobe and Yaga, and they took Chris's name, Dawson. In the small coastal town, which had a population then of about 10,000 people, Chris's history was pretty much unknown. Yeah, so it's quite remarkable to me because I would think this would be a nationwide story at least, right? But people there didn't know that his wife had disappeared. Well, I mean, there wasn't much publicity no. after the initial stuff. No, they just kind of took his word for it and didn't really start doing a proper investigation until 1999. Yeah, and that's when they assigned a new detective to the case. And he decided to interview Lynn's parents, her family, and her friends. Well, there's an idea. Why didn't yeah. anyone else think of Amazing. that? Wow. 17 years later. Yeah. The information that began to leak out was really disturbing. So the detective was able to get a warrant that could tap both Chris's and his brother Paul's phones. Nothing significant, though, was ever learned from monitoring their conversations. Yeah, but there were enough questions raised by these interviews with family and friends in order for the case to be escalated. And the next year, the Dawson home was searched. The backyard was dug up around the pool area, and they uncovered a pink cardigan and an old food wrapper that was dated from 1981. So if the cardigan's there and the food wrapper's there, you can kind of date when the cardigan ended up there if they're in the same level of dirt, right? Right. Now, the cardigan had cuts or tears, which appeared to be consistent with cuts from a knife. And there were even some cuts on the sleeves which investigators believed could be possible defensive wounds. And some people who knew Lynn well recognized this sweater as one of her favorites that she wore around the house all the time. But unfortunately, it was in really bad condition. It's been so long. So nothing conclusive came from finding the sweater. Well, and they didn't find any bones or body parts. Just, no. just the sweater mm -hmm. and the food wrapper. Yeah, which just helped to date it. Yeah, so it's... 
interesting but inconclusive about finding the sweater. Right. So disappointing, of course, to all the people who believed that Chris had killed his wife and is getting away with it for all this time. It was in 2001, close to 20 years since Lynette went missing, when a coroner's inquest into her disappearance was finally held. And this was seen as a pretty big victory for Lynn's loved ones. Despite there being no body, the coroner did conclude that it was likely that Lynette was dead and that she had been killed by who was described as a known person. And of course, the known person would be Chris Dawson. So the recommendation of this coroner's inquest report was that the known person should face charges for the murder of Lynette. So this was exciting, but it kind of went nowhere. Chris had another brother named Peter who was a lawyer, and he defended Chris. There would end up being two coronal inquests, the one in 2001 and in 2003, which Peter Dawson was involved in. So Peter Dawson said, We are disappointed at the decision of the DPP as there is clear and uncontested evidence that Lynn Dawson was alive long after she left Chris and his daughters. And that's because people here and there would say they had a sighting of Lynn, which is common to happen. We know how eyewitness evidence is, and there was never any proof that anyone saw Lynn Dawson after that day. None whatsoever. Now, police responded, at least in 2001, by saying that they didn't have enough evidence to prosecute Chris Dawson. So that fizzled. Two years later, a second coroner's inquest was held. This was in 2003. Now, this was a much more extensive inquest, and it even included important testimony from Lynn's family and friends. So the only interview by Chris occurred in 2003, and this is a few months after the coroner's finding. He was interviewed by Kara Lawrence, who's a crime reporter with the Sydney Daily Telegraph. The headline of the article was, I did not kill my wife. So Chris wasn't working because he had been suspended from his teaching job at a Catholic all-girls high school. And he told Kara that he had thought of suicide, but he didn't want to do that to his family. And he knew if he killed himself, that people would say he was guilty of killing Lynn. He said he had made mistakes but he was not a murderer. He didn't murder anyone. He said he had no reason to believe that Lynn was not alive, but he couldn't understand why she never contacted her family over all these years. Yeah, so that's something to think about here. It's not only that she hadn't contacted anyone. There are no banking records. She was a registered nurse. There were, she never used her documents to find a job. You know, she had never applied for a new license. She never had property, a utility bill, a phone, nothing. Yeah. There's no record of her being alive. Just totally vanished. Yes. So by this point, of course, Joanne Curtis was divorced from Chris. She'd left him in 1990. And she testified that he had become very controlling and threatening with her. She said that she left because she felt like her life was in danger from Chris. Chris Dawson was, she said, in fact, a very violent man, and she had begun to believe that Chris had killed Lynn and she could be next. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable concern. Right, so for the second time, the coroner's conclusion was that Chris Dawson should be charged with Lynn's murder, but once again, he was not arrested. The man who was in charge of New South Wales prosecutions at the time was convinced that his decision not to prosecute Chris Dawson was the correct one. Yeah, he actually told the press, without a body, without knowing, first of all, whether in fact she is dead, without knowing, secondly, if she is dead, how she died, it's very hard to mount a case of a reasonable prospect of conviction just on motive and the undefined existence of means and opportunity. That makes it very weak. So what do you think? You think it was weak? I mean, there is a lack of physical evidence. Well, that's true, uh, but there's a lot of circumstantial evidence. Yes. And convictions have been made with that. Yes, without a body. Sure. So I don't know that it makes it very weak. It certainly makes it tougher to prosecute, but it doesn't seem like it's an insurmountable difficulty. Yeah, I would agree. I would think it would be possible. Maybe not the easiest case, but probably worth a try, right? Right. So the case again just kind of went cold until 2015 when the case was reopened. 
This time, police made the decision to finally investigate Lynette's disappearance as a murder inquiry, rather than starting out with a missing person inquiry. So for the next three years, detectives gathered more and more evidence. It was a difficult case because so much had been ignored back when Lynette had first disappeared. If a proper investigation had been done when she disappeared, it might have been a much easier case. I mean, there were so many potentially crucial interviews that had not happened. Since the important and difficult questions had not been asked at the time, Chris Dawson's story had just been accepted as truth without really being investigated. You know, also, after 30 years, people's memories are faded, and it's less credible to a jury. And any significant physical evidence that could have been gathered was pretty much gone. But this time, they didn't let that stop them. Yeah, they continued investigating. And by April 2018, they decided that they had enough to take to prosecutors. And they asked for a warrant to arrest Chris Dawson for the murder of his wife, Lynette Dawson. At the same time, there's an investigative journalist named Hedley Thomas, who had released his own findings about the case in a podcast he did called Teacher's Pet. Police thought that they had gathered enough evidence to arrest Dawson, but Thomas's findings in the podcast found even more evidence, and his conclusions certainly implicated Chris Dawson. He had put together a long series of lies and deceptions which the police had failed to investigate properly back in the 1980s. Well, yeah, Thomas would say that he was convinced if the police had only questioned Chris Dawson's story back then, it would have fallen apart. It wasn't a good story. <laughs> it's, it's really stupid. It was. It was really stupid. Also, Thomas was able to find a statement that Chris Dawson had written for police back in 1982. And this was pretty revealing, right? It was. It showed off a lot of his lies. So in the statement, Chris wrote that he had contacted all of Lynn's old girlfriends, but had had no success in getting information on Lynn's whereabouts. Thomas was able to contact many of these women who said, no, oh, Chris never called. So they directly contradict what he had told police. Exactly. The statement also said that Chris and Lynn had been having marital problems for about two years, mostly due to Lynn's overspending. Now, he never mentioned that he was sleeping with one of his students. Well, no, I wouldn't do that. Well, I mean, you might think he was embarrassed to admit that, right? But if he really wanted to help the police find Lynn... It's relevant information that you would tell them. I mean, if he admitted that he was still seeing someone else, that might have explained why Lynn wouldn't come back, why she would stay away, if he was actually innocent. Yep. So hiding it just makes him look more guilty to me. You know, and to pretty much everyone. Oh, definitely. So common sense, along with circumstantial evidence, really should have told the police that Chris Dawson who had a history of violence against his wife and had a teen lover moved into his home, should have really been investigated when his wife disappeared. Now, the 2018 search was primarily an extensive dig at the former home of the Dawsons in Bayview. Backyard was torn apart and excavated. They had a concrete cutter that cut through paving stones, and they dug much deeper in several locations. These included a small area between the rock and the home, another area in the backyard near the clothesline, another area further up in the backyard, and the area surrounding the pool. Now, they also used some laser and video searching technology that wasn't in existence earlier when they were doing the other searches. So, and they did find some anomalies in the earth which were inspected. Well, and there are some other interesting things about this. So after Chris Dawson sold that house, the new owner was doing some work in the yard or some gardening or putting new stones around the pool, something like that. And Chris would come by and ask, what are you doing? (laughs) So he had some interest in what was going on in that yard. Yeah. But investigators dug up that Bayview home for almost a week and found no human remains or any significant clues. So if he'd buried her there, maybe he moved her? Or maybe they just hadn't found it. I mean, it was a pretty big yard. They didn't do every inch, but they did excavate. They went down deep, Yeah. moved the paving stones. It was a pretty good search by this point. 
It sounds as if stopping by and asking what are you doing in the backyard, maybe he did move the remains. Right, but maybe he thought there would be something left. Yeah. Because there were disturbed areas in the earth. But, I mean, we know he had plenty of time to move her. He did. So Chanel Dawson was a four-year-old when she saw her mother for the last time. So she does have some fuzzy memories, but she does remember that Joanne was not able to cope with being a stepmother. And Joanne could be cruel to Chanel and Sharon. And she definitely wasn't a nurturing person. Of course, she's like, what, 17 years old, 18 years old? And she's just a kid herself. Yeah, I mean, I really have a hard time blaming Joanne for anything. I mean, when you think about her family life, the way her mother acted, and what kind of situation she was in. I mean, she was totally manipulated by this guy who was able to manipulate a lot of people, right? Because he had the police believing him. Yeah. He had Lynn under his control. So you really can't blame a 16 or 17-year-old for being manipulated. No. Yeah, so there was a lot of shaming of Joanne, but I really don't think that's fair. She was a victim just as much as Lynn, really. Well, not just as much. She's still alive. Well, you know what I mean, though. Yeah. She's no more guilty than Lynn for being in the situation. But Chris was determined that Joanne was going to become the new mother to his daughters back then, and he had even told the girls that Joanne was their mother. There were notes written by Lynn's mom of things that the girls had said after their mom disappeared, things that their father had told them. And one of those things was that Lynn was never coming back. She wasn't their real mom, but Joanne was their new mom. So how did he know she was never coming back? That's a big thing. That he was so certain she wasn't returning, he had to know she was dead. Yes. There's a testimony of a former babysitter for the Dawsons named Bev McNally, and there's some significance to her testimony, too. She had cared for Lynn's girls, Chanel and Sharon, before Chris got involved with Joanne, and she knew that Lynette loved both her daughters and loved their home. Her family was the top priority. So according to Bev, there was just no way at all that Lynette would have ever left her children or her house. Yeah, and Bev also claimed that Chris was very controlling, and she'd witnessed that. She would recall a story of Chris taking a glass from a cupboard and finding a smear on it and just losing his temper completely, screaming and shouting at Lynn and smacking her violently with a towel. Now, you might not think a towel is really going to hurt someone, but just the act of this shows a lot of aggression. And she also remembered other incidents when Chris was abusive to Lynn. In fact, she said she left the job because he made her very uncomfortable. She didn't want to work there. Now, Chanel says that she never saw her father being aggressive or violent. And she remembers him as just a good old dad, you know, fun, very loving. Did create a lot of confusion because she wants to know the truth about what happened to her mother. But she's understandably worried about learning that her father was not who she thought he was. But that's quite a difficult thing to be thinking about. It's a terrible position for her to be in. Because, you know, if they found Lynn's remains, she would know her dad had murdered her mother. And she'd had a close relationship with her dad. But her sister Sharon was totally convinced that her father's innocent and she will hear nothing about it. She won't talk to anyone about it at all. Chanel had talked to 60 Minutes in Australia about her father and the situation. But, you know, it's just a tough situation. It's really sad for her. Sure is. Chris Dawson, at the time, moved his 16-year-old lover into his house, and he told his kids that Joanne was their real mom. I know. It's amazing. And this shows that Chris knew Lynette would never be back. Investigations, his behavior showed that Chris knew Lynette was dead. His total lack of concern or remorse over her disappearance is hard to explain if you believe that he was completely innocent. Well, sure. His defense attorney referred to sightings of Lynn, and one was an Antiques Roadshow TV show. So this is a popular Sunday evening show on the BBC where a team of antique experts travel around the country and they give evaluations of antiques that are brought to them by members of the public. And in 2006, an episode was filmed in Padstow, Cornwell, a small English seaside town, and the defense claims that a woman in one of these scenes, an audience member just in the background, was actually Lynette Dawson. 
So if this was true and she was alive in 2000 and living in England, the murder case against Chris Dawson would fall apart and it should just be dropped. But there's no evidence that this was Lynn. So I feel like these are just ways to try and distract the investigation. Yeah, probably. In early December 2018, Detectives from the Unsolved Homicide Squad of the New South Wales Police Force made a surprise visit to an investment property owned by Chris. And there he was arrested for the murder of Lynn and charged in Sydney. He denied the charge and pleaded not guilty. Right. So he was in jail for a couple days and released on bail pending his murder trial. In June of 2019, he formally pleaded not guilty to Lynn's murder. And in February 2020, just last month, He was committed to stand trial for the murder of Lynette. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens next. I mean, I'll be keeping an eye on this. Do we know when the trial's going to start? I mean, I would expect sometime this year, right? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how long a wait it'll be. But, you know, Chris is in his 70s now. So even if he's found guilty, he's gotten away with murder for many, many years, which is just disheartening. Well, it's 38 years ago. Yeah, 38 years where she didn't have a life, and he did. So what they've also done is they've taken the podcast Teacher's Pet off of Australian feeds. So uh, hopefully they can find an unbiased jury and give Chris a fair trial. Right, because of course in the podcast, he looks very guilty. That's how the podcast is presented, that he's guilty. Oh, sure. I mean, the podcast, a lot of it is interviews. So it's interviews with people who knew Lynn, who knew Chris... And most of them think that she was murdered by Chris. So it does have that slant. You know, whether it's fair or not, I'm not the judge, but it definitely has that slant. But I mean, there's also this whole issue of the teachers sleeping with the students at the school and how that was ignored. So there's a lot to the story. Yes. So Teacher's Pet is absolutely a source for this podcast, as is a prime documentary called The Teacher's Wife and also a 2003 documentary titled The Teacher's Wife from ABC Australia. Fascinating case. Very. It's just I'm beating my head against the wall, just saying, how (laughs) could you not have investigated in 1982? Right, and is anyone held to task over this? Is there anything that could be done about this lapse? Haven't heard anything. Of course, again, it's so long ago, all those people involved are retired. Right? Yeah, right. So it's not like they can be suspended or lose their jobs. They're right. not working there anymore. Nope. So it's just really sad that that happened. Because you think if it was done properly from the beginning, he probably would have been prosecuted. I got to think that. The way it's been presented is that there's likelihood of him being guilty. Well, yeah. I mean, there's just so well, much that makes him look guilty, right? Right. It really does. And it's just so much to think about. It's really mind-boggling, it is. It certainly is. Yeah. So if Chris had been convicted after Lynn disappeared, if they'd found the right evidence and done the right things, you have to think how that might have saved Joanne because she was in this marriage and had a child with this man. And not just her. I mean, any of these girls who became involved with the teachers and... I think it said in the podcast that there were at least a few more that had actually ended up marrying the teachers after they graduated or when they were older. So you have to just think what this does to these girls' minds. I mean, it really fucks them up. They don't have the normal, you know, going to the prom, having a boyfriend, any of that. A lot of them probably miss out on going to college, and their whole lives are altered by this. Certainly are. So, of course, the focus here is on Lynn because we think that her life was taken away from her. But there's also many more victims in this case who were basically children. You got it. So there's a lot more to it than the murder. Yeah, but all we're going to hear about from this point on is whether Chris is guilty or not. Well, sure. And I would hope that things have changed in those schools. I mean, I'm assuming that they have. We haven't heard anything about this being a continued problem. And, you know, things were different back then. Well, yeah, I mean, we talked about that, but they weren't so different that it's okay to have sex with an underage student. No. That's that's never been okay. That's never been okay. But I think people just didn't talk about things like they do now, right? Things were more covered up. 
They were. Yeah. So, but yeah, it was never okay. Nobody ever thought that was okay. No, and even if they're at the age of consent, this whole teacher-student relationship, no way it should be a sexual one. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's that way in college because they're in a position of power. Right. Yeah. A lot to think about there as well. See what you opened up here? It's a big can of worms. Yeah. It is, but it's just fascinating to talk about. And it makes me feel kind of good that maybe we've made some progress in society. I'm always thinking things are worse now, but in some ways, life is better now than it was. In some ways. In some ways, yep. So thank you to Tristan Capel for writing and producing our music. If you should happen to decide that you're interested in getting some more TCB episodes and offering us some financial support, we do have good stuff coming up in our premium show. So our commercial-free members-only episodes come out every month, plus there's a big backlog of about 40 episodes that are all yours to binge and listen to as soon as you sign up. You can be a Tie Grabber member for as little as $4 a month, and when you join, you have your choice of a Welcome to the Brewery gift, which we send out every couple of weeks. We send out the gift you choose, a nice handwritten thank you note, and some other swag. So if you're interested, just go to tiegrabber.com and click on subscribe to learn more about that. We're going to be moving on to a feedback segment. If you have a case suggestion or comments that you'd like to share about a crime or even a beer, we encourage you to send us a voicemail. We have a special little widget on our website. It's on the right side of the screen, and you can click on that and record your message, either on your computer or whatever device you're on. Another way to send us a voicemail is just to record it on your voice memo function on your phone, paste it into an email, and send it to us. If you're too shy to do that, just send us an email with your comments or suggestions, and that is to truecrimebrewery at tiegrabber.com. Now, we've also brought back a contest we had three years ago, which was really popular, and this is the Beer Review Contest. So all you need to do is record yourself reviewing one of your favorite beers, just as Dick does in the beginning of each of our shows. The submissions will be judged on personality, detail, and just your overall charm in your review. Audio quality is not a factor, so don't worry about that. Just a simple voicemail is fine. Right. I'm the only judge (laughs) on this, and any decision I make is final, so you can't (laughs) complain to me. Yeah. And I would just say, you know, we've we've gotten uh, several really excellent reviews, but I'm looking for more. Oh, yeah. I know a lot of our listeners could do a good job at this. Absolutely. Yeah. So get some beer reviews into me, and sometime in the spring, we'll have a winner. We will. And the prize is really cool. It's a pair of my favorite Bluetooth earbuds, and these are waterproof, wireless, Excellent. Great for listening to podcasts or music while you're running or even swimming because they are actually waterproof. I use them in the shower. If I'm in the middle of a good podcast and I have to shower, I always hated taking the thing out of my ear, but now I don't have to do that. You see? So they're awesome, and I'd like to share it with one of our listeners. Yeah, it's a little disconcerting when I'm lying in bed at night with you and there's this thing flashing in your ear. Ah, but you're used to it now. I am. Took a while. (laughs) (laughs) I was thinking, oh, you're some kind of android or something. Yeah, I kind of am. So what have you got for feedback, Dick? The first and only voicemail is from Daniel, who is an Australian gentleman, and he has a case suggestion. G'day, Dick and Jill. My name's Daniel, and I live on the Gold Coast, Australia. I just wanted to say that I discovered your podcast about a month ago, and I love it. I put it on every time I get in the car. I also have a case suggestion for you, and that's the case of Daniel Morecambe. It's one of Australia's most well-known murder cases. Keep up the good work. Bye. All right. Thanks, Daniel. I know that was a little crackly. The audio wasn't great, but, you know, I just love the accent, so we had to play it. Well, it's an interesting case, and as Daniel said, it's a pretty famous case. It's one of the most extensive investigations ever undertaken in Australia. It's a real heartbreaker, though, Dick. I can only do so many of these really heartbreaking cases that involve children. Yeah, it's tough. It this is. is a little boy who's 13 years old, and he was abducted in December of 2003. Eight years later, or just about eight years later, they found bones that were identified as Daniel's, and they 
charged a man named Brett Cowan with his murder. He was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Despite that, and we've talked about the sentencing in other countries, so despite being sentenced to life in prison, he'll be eligible for parole in 2031. Which sounds futuristic, but it's really not that long. Now, wasn't this guy involved in other cases, they believe? Possibly. They yeah. don't have proof. Nope. Yeah, so, I don't think you just do that once. No. I think that's a good case to look into, though. Absolutely, yes. There's actually, I think, there's a book written about it by his father, which I'm sure will be really sad, but we'll definitely read the book and then make that decision. Right. But I really appreciate the suggestion, so thanks a lot, Daniel. Thanks, Daniel. Then we have a couple emails. First from Liz. She also has a case suggestion. Okay, so Liz writes, I love your podcast. Keep up the good work. I have a case suggestion. This is a case that happened very close to me. The murder of Alina Shaket. In a nutshell, she was 20 years old and very talented. A beautiful girl who had her whole life ahead of her. She was murdered by her ex-boyfriend on October 8, 2017. He was convicted of her murder a year later. It was one of those, if I can't have you, no one can, scenarios. There was a PFA in effect, and I believe she had gone to the police several times for him violating it. Since her death, her parents and brother have created Alina's Light to promote Alina's Law. Alina's Law, Pennsylvania House Bill 588, will protect victims of domestic violence by giving the court a mechanism to enforce orders for protection from abuse. Please see their website. It's alinaslight.com. I would love to see this case get the attention it deserves so that Alina will not die in vain. So unfortunately, crimes like this happen far too often. All too often, right? You hear about it all the time. It's just dreadful. And, you know, we have these protection orders, but do they really work? Well, I suppose they do to an extent, but time and again, you read about people that just totally ignored these orders. Well, yes, because they can't be arrested until they're caught being close to the person. Yep. And if they're determined to kill someone, that's not going to stop them. It's totally not. So and anything that can toughen those laws up Absolutely. would be a help. It would be a big help because you have to think there's a whole family there that's just shattered by this. It's very pointless. So thank you very much, Liz, for that recommendation. It's a good one. It is. And then I have an email from Dawn who has another case suggestion. Dawn says, I recently found your podcast and I'm truly hooked. I love listening to you both, especially when you make Dick laugh, Joe. That's hard to do, you know. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> I'm such a fun-loving guy. Yeah, you're fun-loving, but, you know. You're <laughs> I guess. Very, you know, kind of consistent. Not like someone who's up and down and all over the place. That's what I love about you. See? <laughs> so Dawn says, I thought I'd suggest an interesting case for you guys to cover. This is a case of Eric C. Hansen from Naperville, Illinois. He's convicted of killing his parents, sister, and brother-in-law after committing identity theft and stealing thousands of dollars from his parents. Something like 80000 I read. I think one of our listeners sent me a link to this on Instagram. I don't think it was Don. I think it was someone else. But yeah, this was just crazy. Yeah. Really right. terrible. Eric had been convicted of retail theft and home invasion as a teenager, and the parents wanted to project this perfect image of the family, and this was incredibly important to them. So they covered up for him, and they made excuses for him. And Eric sank himself into debt, trying to keep up with the Joneses as well as his numerous girlfriends, and began stealing money from his parents. Now his mother found out about it, as well as his middle sister, Katie. And Katie threatened Eric with telling their father about the theft, and then he threatened to kill her. And then not long afterwards, his parents, his sister Katie, and his brother-in-law turned up dead. The story itself is intriguing, but what's more interesting is that there was almost no physical evidence to convict Eric. I've read about this story, including the appeal decision, which you can find online, and I'd love to hear your take on this one, guys. Please consider reviewing the case. 
Well, absolutely. We'll consider that. Thank you, Don. Yeah, I'm mean, starting to look things up and seeing how much information I can get because, yeah. you know, we got to have info. If yeah. No data, there's no case we can do. You need a lot to fill an hour. But do we know how he killed them? There's no physical evidence. That I find that strange when you kill so many people, that there could be no evidence. Well, I guess there's no physical evidence linking him to the killing, right? Right. Okay. So he's not got blood on his hands or clothing or whatever. Sure. Well, look. But how does a person do that? You know, you're just taking out pretty much your whole family over money. Yeah. And there's something wrong with this person. And you're thinking that you can do this and get away with it? Well, that's a whole other thing. I mean, just the fact that you would do it, even if you could get away with it, is crazy. But then to think you could get away with it doubles the craziness. It's even crazier. It is, yeah. And, you know, these ones where the kids kill the parents always bother me a lot because I feel like parents give so much to their kids, you know, for the most part. And it sounds like these parents did. It's like a huge betrayal. I mean, they were covering up for him, trying to help him. And then he does this. Yep. It's terrible. It's really hard to imagine. Well, it is. I mean, it's kind of the opposite of the upbringings that a lot of people have that turn to to murder and stuff, that they've just had this horrendous upbringing. And not that it's an excuse, but you can say, well, okay, that's all this kid knows. But this kid was treated more than adequately. Well, you know, it really reminds me of the Bart Whitaker case. Yeah. I mean, he was very entitled. His parents bought him a condo, and he pretended to go to school and then paid someone to go kill his family. Same with this one, although he didn't pay anybody. He just did it himself. He just, yeah, he took it upon himself. It's mm-hmm. just a very different murder that you don't see all too often, thankfully. Thankfully, yeah. that's right. But it is shocking. It's absolutely shocking. It is. That's all our feedback for today. All right. Well, thanks for putting that together. That's some great feedback. I really appreciate it. And everyone, take care of yourselves and stay well. Don't panic, but wash your hands. Wash your hands. (laughs) Dr. Dick says wash your hands. And where will they see us next time? At the quiet end, of course. That's right. We'll be here waiting for you. So everyone, have a great week. We'll save the seats. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.